So welcome everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for coming. I know reading week is kind of an odd time to come to talk, so I really appreciate you guys coming out here instead of studying diligently for your classes or grading papers or whatever else you're responsible for doing today. This is our last speaker of the series. We set the best for last. Um, we are honored to have Gil Cortes here. Um, Diego Wigil, unfortunately, is on sabbatical this semester, and so he wasn't able uh, to, to join us. But Gil is here representing both uh, authors of this very interesting work. Um, before we get started, I wanted to first thank uh, my staff people who make all of this possible. Christina Last, Ching Wa Chu, who's the person who does all the beautiful artwork for us. Uh, Rosa Rodriguez, who isn't here yet. and. Um, Alejandro Jimenez, who also, I guess, hasn't, hasn't gotten here yet. And to alert you to our first talk for the spring semester, which is going to be January 27th, Danny Solorzano of UCLA and Amanda Datnow of UC San Diego are going to be here talking about they have um, been doing this ongoing project on post-secondary transitions of youth and poverty. And they're going to be giving us a three-year update on where they are with their work. And so we're very excited about that. So we're hoping all of you can join us. Um, introducing our distinguished speaker today, is my esteemed colleague from the Graduate School of Education, Patricia Baquedano Lopez, who is a linguistic anthropologist who studies language socialization and literary practices at the intersect with ideologies about language use, ethnicity, race, class, and immigrant status. Um, she has just recently come back from sabbatical in Paris, and I am envious to say she's going back to Paris to work on her new book, which we all await with anticipation, and we're very pleased to have her with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And let me just get the, let me just say that it is a pleasure and an honor to introduce Professor Roberto Conchas, who is associate professor of education and chancellor's fellow at the University of California, Irvine. Professor Conchas um, obtained his PhD in sociology from the University of Michigan and Arbor. Prior to joining the UC Irvine faculty, Professor Conchas was assistant professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. He most recently served as senior program officer with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, managing their research portfolio on U.S. inequity as part of the special initiatives program. They had the best man, for he has a great heart and a great vision for educational change. He has been a visiting scholar at the University of Barcelona, at the University of Southern California, San Francisco State University, and at the University of Washington. The focus of Professor Conchas' research is in urban school success, social inequality, and education, as well as in educational policy and reform. His research on social equity and urban schools has appeared in the Harvard Ed Review, Research in Sociology of Education, Youth and Society, and the Teachers College Record. Um, to name a few, these are all top journals in our field of education. He is the author of The Color of Success, published by Teachers College Press. This is a landmark book, and we are grateful to you for having written it. Um, in the book, uh, Professor Conte shows us great how, how programs um, based on successful integration, community building, and access to opportunities can serve as a model for how institutional mechanisms can promote um, the social mobility of urban minority student populations. He argued consistently and convincingly throughout this book that it is important to move beyond the static notions of school failure and towards a more complex and nuanced understanding of goodness and successes. I just said that the book has been reviewed in 10 different uh, prestigious journals and in encyclopedias. Professor, Professor Conscious is also co-author with Louis Rodriguez of the book Small Schools and Urban Youth. In this book, um, the authors identify the quality of the relationships among members of small school communities, both student-teacher and student-student, as being crucial for the academic success of black and Latino students. Um, but I think what they suggest more forcefully is that these relationships need to be agentally nurtured in school culture. Today, we're excited to hear more about his third book, co-authored with James Dave Hill. Street Mars, School Smart, Urban Poverty, and Education of Adolescent Boys. And judging by the description of this talk, we can see the mark of the scholarship that emerges from nuanced and beautiful work, from a bold commitment to make sure that we reconceptualize the meanings of urban youth, and in particular, of what we mean by the education of young men of color. We know that this work is also motivated by the unwavering belief that we can know that we need to facilitate these students' academic success. 
Please join me in welcoming Professor Hubert Pontus. Man, that's making me nervous. <laughs> um, people who you know heard me talk before, I like I like starting with stories. One of the recent stories, you know, it's been part of me for a long time, is that my little brother Jesse is currently serving a life prison sentence, and uh, he's been in prison since he was 16, and he's currently 36 years old, and. That's what actually originally brought me to graduate school and to sociology in particular to ask why is it that some low income urban youth join gangs and others don't? And what is it about the, the social ecology of a community that mediates you know, that kind of choice, if it's a choice, for some of our young populations? And I originally went to the University of Michigan to try to address that question you know, over 10 years ago. And you know, my advisor said, you know, perhaps you're too close to this topic. You, know, you ought to pick something else. And I said, well, let's ask the same kind of question within the educational setting. Why, why is it that some low-income populations do well and others don't? Um, and that resulted you know, in the color of success, it resulted in the second book. Um, and now I'm full circle again. Now I have the opportunity to work with you know, one of the most internationally known gang scholars, anthropologist, uh, Diego Bejit. Uh, and for the last, when I joined the faculty at Irvine in 2004, you know, we, we said, you know, we need a book that merges these bodies of literature. It merges the, the literature on youth gangs and it merges the literature on school success. But adding a, a third component, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Unfortunately, Diego couldn't be here. We're going to be the, you know, you know he, he's a street smart doing like this. You know, I'm the school smart, right? He said, thank you. Right? So it, it goes well. It goes well. So there's another component is, is the component of the community. Right? The component about community-based organizations and the roles they have in navigating the different kind of uh, pathways for, for these kids. And so I'm talking about uh, a study that actually I did with Lee Rodriguez back at Harvard, and it's in a community-based organization that deals with truancy. This particular study led to a current study I'm doing in LA which I'm looking at 32 community-based organizations funded by the California uh, Community Foundation and uh, uh, understanding how they're building civic capacity within these communities and how they're empowering these young uh, uh, boys and girls and empowering parents to advocate for their kids. So if you bear with me, and thank you for the invitation, Lisa, to come out here. Lisa and I were colleagues at Irvine and now we stole her away. You know, but she looks happy. Right? <laughs> Thank you for the great introduction, Patricia. Uh, so I'll begin. Every Monday night, the organization rents four vans as a mode of transportation for the club participants. The four adults, including the president, drive around the low-income communities of Metro Boston, oh, I can read over here, and pick up each student at their doorstep. doorstep. According to the adults, the purpose of picking up every student is to make sure that they get to the club and to ensure their safety. On this particular day, we ride with the president as he picks up nine students. We turn into a housing development, the projects, and we meander through the parking lots in the van as the sun goes down. As we look around the housing development, we see a sea of black and Latino faces. We observe many kids running around, young people hanging out in staircases, and a group of young boys playing basketball on a court in the distance. The president honks the band's horn and waves at various people outside their apartments. We continue through the parking lot and suddenly the van stops. We apparently went over a speed bump where our initial thought was that the rented van had stalled. Suddenly and without hesitation, the 6'2 white 
red-headed president of the organization, jumps out of the van and stops an approaching car. We look over at the vehicle with two young black females sitting inside. The passenger is holding an infant, no more than six months old. The president opens the driver's side door and practically pulls the young woman out of the car. He enthusiastically gives the young woman a hug. He then reaches for the infant, hugs and kisses the baby, and makes small talk with the two young women. Up to this point, we were uncertain about the president's actual face-to-face -face relationship with low-income community, low-income people of color in these neighborhoods. This night, however, exuded a climate of respect and trust between a white, middle-class man and a community of low-income urban residents of color. The purpose of the weekly meetings was to provide space for young people to A, feel safe, B, be treated as important citizens of the community, and C, be given opportunities to empower themselves through community building and critical thinking activities. This critical space, in combination with other processes, increased self-esteem, maturity, and confidence, thereby allowing young people to find and pursue a positive role in their schools, communities, and society. In Boston, you know, there's a whole issue of truancy because of the exit exams, right? So you have these kids taking the exams, not passing in middle school, and so you still have some kids that are 16, 17 years old, right? And they eventually drop out. So there's this huge problem there. Um, so we know, for instance, the research says that the community context impacts the school context. And truancy is correlated with dropout. And this is particularly significant in low communities of color. And we also know with recent research uh, uh, that CEOs and school partnerships are vital. Uh, Mark Warren, who's at Harvard, he just came out with a new book. Uh, I think it's called Fire in the Heart by Oxford University Press, where he's looking at the role of uh, uh, actually white activists in community-based organizations <coughs> that uh, push this kind of agenda. And so why are urban schools struggling? Poverty and community factors. We know that unequal schools, unequal resources equals unequal outcomes. It's kind of like Robert Rambaugh's right unequal origins. Right? Um, what's that? It is Cynthia. <laughs> Cynthia Philly Sam, right? Unequal, unequal origins. Yes. So an ad inadequate community school connections, uh, resource inequities, how segregation matters, uh, pervasive and worsening trends in race and economic segregation in the largest urban areas, and this is the kind of work that Gary Orfield has been doing for a long time. And there's this perpetuation of the cycle of poverty in the inner city, right? That we can't ignore the issues of health care. We can't ignore, uh, it's hard for me, I usually walk around and, um, and I have a clicker. Uh, community environmental challenges, uh, the housing, the joblessness, right? Uh, a lot of these issues then impact the ability of schools to do their job. We know the, you know, the school factors, right? The internal processes within school. This is the zero tolerance, the tolerance policies, uh, the concentration of uh, counterproductive policies in the most vulnerable schools, uh, uh, low teacher expectations within schools. A lot of the stuff that I talk about in my first book, ask, access to low quality curriculum and pedagogy the whole tracking system. Um, we know that large school size is associated with, uh, with poor outcomes. And this whole issue of the, the, the high stakes standardized testing, right? Uh, my co-author the second book, Louis Rodriguez calls it this test pedagogy, right? And there's this increase in dropout rates post no child left behind. So again, we know that there's this education crisis, uh, right? There's this pervasive achievement opportunity gap in terms of test scores, graduation, and college going rates, and this whole notion of these you know, limited opportunities to learn. Uh, this high school graduation dropout rate crisis, 70% nationally, 
but 50% were black and Latino students. However, you have some school districts, like in South LA, where it's over 70% dropout. Uh, again, leading to the leaking pipeline. 9,100 Latino Latino students and 1,400 blacks will complete college, compared to 2,900 whites. Uh, uh, 4 in 100 black and Latino students earn a master's or professional degree. And look at this, 3 in 1,000 black and Latino students will earn a doctorate. So what is the role of community-based organizations? Uh, research suggests that high schools serve as a drop-off producing factory. Uh, again, the school's internal processes, structure for failure, as well as the external factors, the social, economic, and political context in which the schools are embedded in. CBOs recognize the relationship between the internal and the external. Right? So they structure these unique approaches to re-engage youth and prioritize school success and college preparation can serve as a possible pathway out of, out of poverty. And what, um, Patricia mentioned that I was involved with Gates, and one of the issues here was what, could, what can community-based organizations do right, to re-engage kids and get them back on the path towards graduation? However, when we were trying to fund community-based organizations, it was one of the hardest things to do because typically they don't have evaluation processes to show that they're actually successful. So the Boston Urban Youth Foundation. It's a faith-based, community-based organization. Targets low-income black and Latino youth. It attempts to develop these kids spiritually emotionally, academically, and economically, provides these wonderful social and educational scaffolding, concentrates on high school graduation and is college-oriented. The goals were to reduce uh, truancy by 70%, to improve academic achievement, to prepare kids for uh, uh, entrance and success in college, and really reduce the uh, digital divide, and really concentrated on technology. For this talk, though, I'm not concentrating on <coughs> had three components, and if you have questions, feel free to ask me as we go on, or, or is it typical to ask questions after? Usually after. Then I'll go through it and then people can ask <laughs> Unless you want, you know, I can entertain. He's an economist, you know, they can't help themselves. But I do, <laughs> Norton, I do go to the community. <laughs> you have to explain what that is. It was a good conversation. Um, the three major components of the uh, Boston Urban Youth Foundation. One is the school success program. It deals with school attendance, performance, engagement uh, with school from middle school youth. The second is the AEC, the Academic Enrichment Center. It deals with skill building, tutoring, uh, computer training, self-esteem exercises. And the third is this college visions, which deals with grades. SAT preparation, college visions, uh, and uh, for high school kids. So it kind of like a scaffolding from middle to high school and then to college. Now they have a lot of cohorts, and we're doing a follow-up where a lot of the cohort from these kids went to college, and now they're back and serving as like, like uh, uh, mentors and, uh, and, and other roles there. So here's the BYF in action. At the center, it's the student. Am I moving around too much? At the center is the student, and at the core here is the case manager, right? Where they do this vision casting, they do a positive peer group, academic skill building, and the whole mentorship. So really the key are these like adult role models that I'll talk about soon, and this whole notion and the scaffolding around it. Who does the UYF serve? Serves over 500 youth. 11 to 16 year olds, inner city Boston. And this is great because now we're, we're comparing this program with other programs in LA. 51% um, female, 70% black, and 30% Latino. And as you know, if you take the LA context, you can probably switch these two numbers around, right? Or even higher Latino, would you say, in LA? Uh, uh, you assess, assess the program through various uh, middle school partners. Uh, courts, the Department of Youth Services, uh, Network of Police, Churches, and other uh, CBOs. So 
So what, what are the lives of BYF youth? Which I, I call it like this unhealthy community. Uh, uh, they deal with a, a host of, of factors affecting these kids, uh, like violence, substance abuse, uh, drugs, gangs, court involved, school failure, stress, anxiety, poor health, and the list can go on. Um, most are on probation and they're active chins, a child in need of, of services or court cases. Uh, experience major life events, uh, arrest, death of family members, stabbing, shooting, molestation, etc. Uh, use drugs, alcohol frequently, uh, court involved, uh, and many are street socialized towards gangs. And this is one of the theoretical things that we're developing with Diego Vigui, is this whole notion of street socialization. And how that leads to a, a, a term he coined multiple marginality, which takes the whole ecology right, of the neighborhood and forming these street socialization kids. And we're arguing there's a continuum of socialization in terms of the ones that become the most street socialized tend to become the gang members. And remember, it's not like all the kids in our communities become gang members. It's, it's about 10% of actual folks become gang members. Yes? Um, how are they like, uh, recruiting these kids? The gangs? Or no, the, the BUYF. Well, well, they did it through um, uh, multiple ways. So part of the biggest recruitment was that they were referred to by the middle school, where they were becoming truant. So often they become truant, then the court gets involved. Uh, um, but most of them, and it's interesting, most of the kids, and this is what we're going to see through here, uh, word of mouth, right? So then kid says, they're, you know, I'll explain why. The kids start going there and they're liking it, right? And they feel like this is an important space for them. And they tell other kids. And so as I'll show you here, space becomes very important. So uh, the research strategy. Uh, we conducted in-depth case study methodology, and part of a larger study of gangs, community-based organizations and schools, and you know, Diego Mejia's ongoing work on youth gangs. He just recently came out with a new book. He comes out with a book every year, practically. <laughs> yeah. uh, his new book is called Gang Redux, and it's really a nice kind of policy uh, uh, a book on what we can do Right, to stop kids from joining gangs. And once those kids have joined, what we can do to re-engage them. Uh, combines our work, the work I do on schools, and the work he does on schools. I think one of his books that he published in 90-something uh, called Personas Mexicanas. It's this thin, but it's packed with so much important information. And it was a longitudinal study where he looked at kids in 1974 and again 15 years later. So he's done a lot of work on, on schools. And my current research funded by the California Community Foundation uh, uh, on 32 community-based organizations, right? Um, and, and for this study, uh, I wanted to concentrate on one of the organizations. Uh, how and why the program was re-engaging youth. It focused on really on youth perspectives and their experiences. Although, again, you know, we do interview and we do observations with the adults in the programs, uh, uh, interviews, observation, document analysis, and really try to make sense of how participants make sense of their experiences. It's not a job talk, so I'm not getting into the <laughs> methods and stuff, right? Uh, so basically, here are the research questions. You know, how does BUF mediate the social and academic experience of the youth it serves? How can a community school partnership mediate against youth truancy and dropout? And how do low-income urban youth perceive their experiences in and out of schools? Uh, how do these type of organizations empower youth and build civic capacity in poor neighborhoods? Because I think that's what's key. Uh, for, not just for the kids, but for the adults. What we found is these four, isn't that a nice picture? Yeah. I can put it in the policy brief. Yeah. So these four, four pillars of EUI of success. They all describe in detail. Uh, the one is the social network, the incentive structure, the space, and youth advocacy. And this becomes very central. The whole network process becomes very central to how this all, all this plays out. And this is the first time I'm giving this talk. 
but you know, you can help me kind of conceptualize. Uh, I always turn back to to social capital, but I think it needs something else. Um, and you can help me with it. Huh? It's, it's UCLA. Yeah, I know. That's why I said kept healing. Not that one. No, I should put an anteater in there. You see her with anteaters. No one knows what you're talking about. Social. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they both, both went to Irvine Underground. Yeah. No eaters. <laughs> so social networks. The program staff prioritized access to role models and mentors who could forge opportunities and deliver information to marginalized urban youth. In fact, program participants identified the power behind social networks that, according to students, operated to foster a pro-school ideology. And I just, you know, put some quotes on there to, for you guys to, to get a sense of that. Uh, one student says, yeah, because I got a whole bunch of people that I am friends with and I've got older adults that I have to take care of me. Another student, very poignant here, uh, okay, let me say, Mike, which is the caseworker, again, the caseworker becomes very central, told me about a couple of things with girls. Like, you can have sex and be sexually active with girls and stuff, but he told me to keep safe, and because I have a girl now, I want to take it slow, because all the advice he gave me, like he, like Mike, is like a father tell me advice and stuff, and I take it to if he listens, and just use it in a way that helps me with my social life and personal life and everything. Okay? And I guess just giving you a sense of that whole notion of social networks. The, the second is the incentive structure. So incentives were very, some were very simple, such as a ride to the subway station or home. Food, oh, food's always important, right? You guys have food here after. It's always important in the after-school program or an all-expense-paid overnight college visit. Uh, and to encourage you to attend the tutoring sessions, for instance, uh, they always had a, a pizza and soda for the students. Uh, one student, for instance, says, I really, really want to go. Another student shared the same conviction about the program. It was like, you know, the program takes you places. You know, they, they go to see colleges and stuff to see how kids start in college stuff that college kids do, and stuff, and lots of stuff, <laughs> right? Another student says, yes, field trips help me a lot. It shows me about what life is about. I went to this trip, I think it was last month, with Ruthie and Mike, you know, the program staff. We went to this college. There was something about the college. I really do want to go to college. I'm going to school, I'm, I'm doing good in school. Remember, these kids were kids that were really disengaged, right? On the verge of actually dropping out. Some kids were in gangs, some weren't. You had a whole mix. Space, again, space becomes very critical here. Uh, social space is a tangible, created, and often delicate artifact to social life. Some argue that space consists of sites where identity, culture, and resistance is built and fostered. For instance, one of the kids says, to keep, to keep kids off the streets, try to keep them somewhere productive and keep them somewhere safe. Give them another home to go to when they are in trouble. Right, the significance of that. Another student says, it feels great. Instead of slacking up, students are trying to succeed. All these kids, the ones that are not in BUYF, uh, are getting in trouble. They're not, they're not doing nothing. So they got nowhere to go and only no trouble, right? who you know, the peer relation. Um, the fourth pillar is youth advocacy. So advocacy within the program was reflected by the principle of supporting and voicing the concerns of young people who are often, in this key, institutionally marginalized and powerless in their families, schools, and communities. They had these adults, right, who advocated for them in these different domains. And again, I'll offer three different kind of examples. My caseworker encourages to go more to school. And she tells me, if I don't go to school, to call her and let her know why, and stuff like that. Teachers, administrators are different, another student say, said. They change. I am in a smaller class now, and before, the teacher did not give me that much attention. 
So now my classes are smaller because my caseworker talked to the school counselor. Again, an advocate. Oftentimes, these kids' parents can't act as advocates. Uh, they might be uh, uh, you know, immigrants themselves. They, they're working you know, two or three jobs. They're not savvy about you know, the, the schooling system. Um, yeah, I used to think that people are against me because they weren't hearing me out. It was all me. They were throwing it all on me, so I didn't want to hear nothing that school had to say because every time I used to do something, they used to blame it all on me. Sounds like me and Irving. <laughs> now that I'm going on to this program, it doesn't happen no more. Again, they have these adult advocates. So I'm still dealing with this you know, theoretical contribution. And again, bring it back to social capital, right? That, you know, is the resources, resources obtained through relationship and social networks. And in particular, it's these intangible resources one gains right, through social networks and relationships. Often people equate social networks with social capital, right? But it's actually the intangible resources, the knowledge you gain through those type of relationships. And so I'm, I'm arguing here that through BUYS extensive networks of family, school, and community, youth acquire the necessary social capital to re-engage in school and community to succeed. That is, they acquire the information, support, and supervision that closely knit networks of relationships provide. Okay? So again, looking at these the networks of pillars of BUY success. You have the network here, which is central to how all this plays out. Program alumni can come back and serve different roles. I mean, they're the success stories. They've been through it. And they're the biggest kind of recruitment you can have. Adult mentors, uh, college tutors and students, and their own peers helping each other out which all creates this whole form of incentive. And you know, sometimes the sentence can go in youth. I mean, I just try to kind of uh, categorize things. Uh, sociologists love categorizing. Uh, incentives versus food, right? Rides, college visits, the kind of resources you have at UCLA, right? Space. This was a great uh, 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 building. It was in Roxbury, Dorchester, two-story. Um, and they really provided a a safe environment for these kids really to dialogue. Uh, some powerful stuff, these, they had Monday Night Club, powerful conversations they had about their lives. What is it like to be a black or Latino male you know, in society? What is it like to be you know, a, 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 a teenage girl pregnant? You know, what, what are these issues that are going on? These kids had deep understanding. They feel safe to talk about it. They were engaged and it was a respectful place. Right? Adults and peers. And again, the youth advocacy. Right? Uh, advocates that came from the family, school, or community, uh, supportive adult voice, and very encouraging. Uh, again, we can break this down in different ways, but I just tried, for purposes of the talk, kind of uh, put it this way. So in power, and really, the, the, the program truly tried to empower uh, uh, these kids. And, According to the program president, empowerment is achieved when young people have the social, critical, and academic skills necessary to create positive changes in their lives, community, and society as a whole. The president of the organization strongly believed that youth are empowered when they realize their strengths and have the proper support to build on them. The program operated in the belief that to move young people from alienation and failure, program staff, staff must engage youth in every aspect of their life. Something that often schools can't do. Schools are constrained by so many factors and forces, right? So how is it that external processes can work with schools to deal with some of these issues, right? Schools often can't deal with the emotional. They can't deal with a lot of the, you know, you saw your father get shot the day before, right? Or they, they, all these issues that are external to schools the schools really don't have the ability to deal with. I'm going through this talk pretty quickly. Yes, you are. Is that bad? No, no that's no. good. <laughs> <laughs> you, then you can talk about it later. Yeah. There's no problem. So, so, so here's examples of how, you know, uh, uh, examples of how they felt that uh, uh, 
the program was transforming lives. Uh, one student says, other students should really learn to come to school and know that they really don't know what is going on. And another student says, yes, the program helps me a lot. It shows me about what life is about. Another student says, like today in the morning, my friends were telling me to skip school. But I said, no, I had to go to school. Plus, I had to take the school exam. I told him, no, it's not cool. Later in the interview, uh, he remarked, yes, I go to school every day. Never be late like I used to before. Wake up in the morning and be lazy. I'm not lazy anymore in the morning because I know school is important. Another two examples. Yeah, it's kind of uh, hit me. Yeah, to make, to make me because this program was about us. Getting back to school, so uh, they was giving us enough courage in order to go back to school. And finally, it helped me get back on track, bring my grades up and try to stay in school more. I don't skip school. I tell my mother if I'm sick, I tell her I got to, I got to go to school because I can't have no more absences. The program really helped me. So it really gives them a pro-school ideology. So what, what are the kind of lessons learned? Uh, uh, youth perspectives and experiences really brought this humanistic dimension to research. Uh, and now I'm doing more more uh, uh, action-oriented research, applied research. Um, schools are not immune from the social equality of poverty. We seem to think that schools can fix everything, right? But it's not really fixing what's happening out there. Um, the effectiveness of building bridges across institutions, like school, community, and family. And I brought in this whole notion of accountability, right? Uh, Understanding how program objectives and program structure and culture impact these lives. And finally, understanding of how critical and positive relationships have an impact. And I think this, this is, has been consistent throughout my research, is that relationships are so important. Relationship within schools that I've shown before, and now relationship outside of schools. So street smart, school smart. Again, just to give you an overview. It really kind of marries the research on gangs with the research on out of school and school and within school processes. So what we want to do here is is really present a, a policy recommendations to promote success, not to show that we have these kids that are, that, that are so marginalized and in gangs and never never did, but but showcase those young populations that. For some reason, because of this whole social ecology, or what we're calling multiple marginality, didn't do well. Perhaps we're in prison, but something happened that they actually got out and are leading productive lives. So we're, sh we're showcasing three case studies in the beginning, one of a Vietnamese, one of a, an African American, and one of a Chicano. They have loved really rough lives, but then managed to succeed eventually. And then we're turning to the role of community-based organizations, right? Uh, the research I'm doing now, a couple of community-based organizations highlighting the kind of good work they do, right? And then we end with, with the role of schools and, you know, the, the school processes that can perhaps help re-engage this population. What else? Thank you. <laughs> about um, a lot of high school football teams. Um, Explain. Uh, they provide positive role models. Um, you can bring back players who went through uh, sports and got to college in it. Um, they have a dis space that's within the school but is distinct from much of the school. Um, let's see, that was incentive space. Um, the advocacy that you could probably there are, you could find examples of and what was the fourth uh, network and, social networks. and certainly the social network stuff and both in terms of the role models and in terms of actually um, uh, connecting kids with walking them through processes 
So this got me wondering whether this is so much about CBOs or about a set of strategies that could um, be within schools. And, and, and you, you made a few comments about uh, the schools uh, don't have the ability to deal with emotion. Well, some do, some, some don't. Some, do. some CBOs do, some, some CBOs don't, right. don't. So I wasn't persuaded what it was there. And even if there's a cost to schools, you know, CBOs come and go, but football remains. <laughs> so, um, and that, that's if that the foundations have the money, right? And the CBOs. It, yeah, whereas football. Well, I think that I think a lot of the, what you're saying is is transferable. I mean, my own research, early research shows that schools can actually do it. Uh, um, so, but uh, so I'm curious about whether there's a CBO component because I didn't. I got a sense that there was a set of services provided, but that there wasn't much community base. And it was serving kids out of school in the community, but I didn't get a sense that this was particularly a community-based organization. Now, it may have been. Well, you know, we, I didn't present the whole thing. I mean, I think this is this is one of the studies we did in Boston, and and that's certainly what I want to do now in the new work is how are they really building civic capacity to help. Uh, the young population and to help parents really advocate for their kids, right? Not just in schools, but politically, right? There's some organizations that they help with, with them economically, right? And how, how do you how do you, you know go about getting a bank loan or starting your own business? Right? So we're in the we're in like like in the very beginning stages for me this kind of work, because I'm completely going from my work I did within schools to the role of community based organizations because there's some good schools that are doing such good jobs. But most schools are not, right? But I don't know if it's quite like a football team. You know, I think I think it's that whole notion of encouragement and that whole humanistic. Uh, I, I just think Eddie helped with this too. I have a study uh, we did for two years at, uh, at a school in Long Beach. And it, it's an all boys academy. You can, I could probably just substitute the boys right, academy into this kind of talk. And there were a lot of transferable factors and influences. I'm going to call the chapter like a football team. <laughs> can, I, can I piggyback on that? Yeah. I think that um, one of the things that community-based organizations have to offer an answer, yeah. but I think that, uh, you know, I, because you're talking about a population that had been, you know, uh, Court adrenal, still, delin oh. de, you know, dual Tell me what, because you're doing good work on this. Uh, <laughs> the point is that I'm making <laughs> is that, um, that, you know, this is a very hard to reach population, and I think there's only so many spaces in a football team only so many kids who can actually have the skills to perform in the football team. And I think these community-based organizations allow you to get at the very disconnected population, the kids who are coming in through courts, through you know, the prisons, through no delinquent. And then, you know, you know, another analogy would be, why, why, are, why is the military doing such a good job at recruiting this population? Why are gangs doing such a good job? You know, so what can community organizations do to deal with their, this very distinct population? Um, uh, and schools can't because they're not going to school, you know. And actually, BYF has its statistics, and they did really well. At, you know, they met their goal of over seven percent. Now they're replicating, and actually, they're working with Pedro Nogueira now. They're replicating uh, in, in New York, I believe. Someone had a. Uh, I was just, just going to think that the difference between a football team and a CBO, or I don't know anything about school. It's BYF. The football team is all male. And that's what a CEO offers, is that it's not only for boys. And big boys. Yeah. And transgender and all the other facets of life. Yes? You're the shy one. I don't think so. <laughs> um, Gil, I always get a little nervous when people start talking about CEOs because just as schools are wildly uneven, there's not that many great ones. Uh, CBOs are wildly uneven. They're not that many great ones, and they're um, spatially, um, they're not spatially, they're not all over the place. And in particular, they're not rural areas. They're, they're typically concentrated in the urban areas. And of course, a lot of Latino kids are in rural areas, and they're not going to get reached. So I guess my question is not from this study of the Boston CBO, it sounds like a wonderful CBO, uh, but, but from your other study of the 32 CBOs, what are the issues in, in actually coming up with CBOs that know how to work well with um, this 
you, and 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 you, all the work that's going on in community colleges, right? They're everywhere. And they are impacting the kind, and that's why I think the Gates and, is it the Lumina Foundation? Yeah. Right, they're pushing this whole double the numbers by the year 2025. But and they're so, not, there are some models of wildly successful CDOs, and I'm thinking particularly of the Industrial Areas Foundation in San Antonio, working with community colleges, but they're not huge numbers of CDOs working with community colleges. And yet all the issues are right. sort of present there. And if you ask, can you find an industrial well, areas foundation in yeah. UNESCO? Yeah. And to be it's honest. It's CSO in What? IF is mainly CSO. Uh, OK, I mean, but again, the point is, it's present in a couple of places, mm -hmm. but not in lots of places. And the, the, big, the big issue is right. the big dollar sign. You know? Yeah. It's right. like, it's a big dollar sign. When I was, again, was I was at the foundation, I couldn't fund a lot of community-based organizations because the president said, well, show me that they're successful. And I said, well, we have to fund them so they can get a good evaluation to show if they're successful or not. And that's one of the big issues. And, and when I, we, we just conducted the first round of interviews with the leaders of each one, that's the main issue, that now their budgets were cut, right? And so they just need money for overhead. But that's a great question. That's something like just I wanted to explore that further. Um, I wanted to bring up uh, two things. Well, one, thank you for presenting. I think thank you for being here. Yeah, yeah. Thank um, you for having me. Um, so I come from Calexico, um, and it's a border town down in Southern California. Um, so in Calexico, we had this uh, 21st century program that all of a sudden hit us really hard, like for a good three years, right? And it brought in like guitar classes, dancing classes, technology, a whole bunch of crazy things. And then after three years, it just completely got cut. Um, so out of that program came a lot of questions of like, wow, like when it was here, like we had, like attendance went up, students were more active, students were more incorporated in studies, and stu um, students from like, were walking with each other home, because it's a really ridiculously small town. But now like, there were like groups of people walking together outside of these classes, and even though it was really late, they were all walking together, so everybody felt safe. Um, so I don't know necessarily the question um, needs to be presented in terms of like money, because I don't, I understand what you're saying in terms of like CBOs being concentrated in specific areas. But if you can get to Calexico, you can get to a lot of places in the United States. The problem is prioritizing education and prioritizing those communities that have traditionally been historically marginalized and thought of as communities that are just going to be in your workforce and serving your jails, right? So until we have that real conversation, we're, we can't even have a conversation of CBOs because you're not seeing me as an able body thinker to go to your institution. I didn't know what Berkeley was until the UC application came out. You see what I'm saying? So those conversations, when you're, but if you ask me the different branches of the military, I'll tell them like this. Right. If you could ask me how many pull-ups I could do, I could go like that because they were always on my campus. But 21st and, century and all, came, all over the television. Yeah, and, and the television and all that stuff. But when 21st century came, they got out-prioritized because they said, oh, well, you're just bringing arts, and you're bringing, like, video, and you're bringing, like, tutoring. Like, those, these kids can do that when they go back home. No, we can't. One, we're predominantly, like, farm-working families that, like, we never see our parents. That's one. Two, who has the money to buy all those things? Um, but I guess my question also was, just to even complicate a little bit of your research, it's interesting what happens with, like, the disconnect when you are coming from those programs and you come to an institution of higher education right. and the programs don't exist for you. Right. right? Like for example, I was an habit. How do you continue that yeah, I, I think I think I think that's the research that needs to happen. Right. Why like, why don't we have continual pro so programs from like pre kinder or right. kinder all the way right. to your PhD? Right. Because a lot of my a lot of the students <laughs> that came from my communities right. dropped out when they got here. So a lot of folks assume that if you're high achieving, you don't need this anymore. But imagine coming, I mean, I came here to the Berkeley campus, and, right? It was just overwhelming, yeah. right? Yeah. But you're right, how do you continue the kind of programs? And the first thing that happens during these tough economic times, they slash this program. Yeah, and, and it's not an accident because then you say something like, oh, well, there's less students of color, so there needs to be less resources and services and programs for the students. 
And then that becomes a conversation instead of like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's let's prioritize all of these students because now we're in this like this diversity like stage where like all diversity is a priority. And now diversity got switched from like students of color and historically marginalized first generation low income to now international students are our diversity of this campus. <laughs> so now there's a shift between student services to international students. <laughs> but there was never even an area where we were the priority. And I, I want to go back to like, you know, again, sad anecdotal because it's based on my uh, personal history. But when I was growing up, uh, I was growing up during the, the Carter years, mm -hmm. and we had, um, we had the West Park down the street uh, that, that, you know, provided all these wonderful scaffolds after school, throughout the summer, uh, college visits, cultural excursions. You know, we had a whole city of issues that kept us off the street. Right? My little brother growing up during the Reagan years, no more West Park. Mm -hmm. What did the kids have? They had the streets. Fourteen of his friends all went through the criminal justice system. He's in prison, some of his best friends. There's two that made it, okay? Two that made it. One of them actually went here to Bolt. In, and the California Youth Authority, he got his undergraduate degree and came here to Bolt, and now he's a practicing lawyer in New York. Right, but you can see again very, very different political differences between two administrations. What my brother Joe and I had versus what Jesse and his friends didn't have. Right, and we, you know, I kind of argue that's this whole notion of people, uh, time, and place. Yes. I was going to say that I'm sorry, but just to follow up on the uh, point on the resources and in um, education, the, the disconnect. And, uh, or the mismatch between home and, community and home and school. Right. And I, I'm reminded of your book, The Color of Success, and, and the three case studies that, that you talked about, and um, what kinds of resources were there for making it successful. So, And what are the, what are the strongest proponents? I mean, like, I'm going back to you know, William Julius Wilson's work right now. Um, when work disappears, right? And he locates uh, joblessness as one of these issues. Mm -hmm. what, what these career academies did very well, mm -hmm. right, is provide kids with internships, and not just vocational stuff, right? It was like internships with doctors and lawyers, mm -hmm. teachers, and, and it, you know, it came kid, kids a vision of what, can, what they can do when they grow up. But, but for a lot of these kids that we talk about now, they don't have jobs, right? There's this sense of hopelessness, right? And jobs give many of these populations, you know, you feel good when you have a job, right? It's just part of life. And, 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 yeah, right, right. And so, and so, I, I, you know, when I was at the, at the Gates Foundation, Hillary Pennington, my boss, and I said, well, why can't we just do career academies and community colleges? Why can't we, Norton? <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I'm going to give you an answer, uh, <laughs> at, which comes out of some work that um, one of my students named Kim Boone is doing. Okay. And I'm actually want to talk to you afterwards about whether Kim should do a presentation later on. This is a presentation where she followed kids from high school into the first year of community college and, and talked to them fall and spring in that first year of community college. Most of the kids are Latino, black, or Asian American. And, uh, and she got a Latina to do the interviews with Latinos and stuff like that. Um, and one of the things that, there is something that is, a, uh, is, is like a career academy in community colleges, and it's called the, um, the, the catalog of courses and programs. And in every single case that you, I've ever seen, a program is laid out, if it's an automotive, if it's English and transfer, if it's you know, med emergency medical technician, the program is laid out with all the courses you want to take. But Kim's got some kids, and they say, you know, I can't use this program. I don't know, I even know where to start. This doesn't tell me, I mean, you know, they have such a limited ability to plan for themselves in this chaotic world of the community college mm -hmm. that you can't hand them a, uh, a, a course catalog, mm -hmm. and the guidance and counseling is terrible, and the faculty don't help them very much, and there's no CDL that's nearby that's doing the kind of right. stuff that you're yeah. talking about. 
And, and so, you know, you can see that there are structures in the college that do exactly that, but they're not available to kids unless they have certain kinds of resources, and nobody's taught them how to do that in, in high school. Nobody's had to do that, they had to do that to the family, and nobody's had to talk to them how to do that. And, and that, that's the other issue, is that typically we wait for the oh, students oh, so to go. So then the final thing is, the faculty says, these kids are not ready to be students, and dismisses them, but nobody is prepared. And they go through this whole, what, what do they call it, developmental courses? Yeah. Terrible. I mean, the, Terrible. I was going to follow up with that. We were talking about sort of the, the negative advancement courses. It's like they get sort of stuck in these. With no crazy uh, skills classes. No transfer. Non core bearing courses. And what they're finding is that, and usually there are three or four layers of courses in math and reading. And so every layer back that they start increases the probability of dropping out before they even take their first <laughs> credit bearing course, which will probably happen. There's after their second year or even third year of community college enrollment, yeah. and so it, it's really a, and, and the kids that end up in, in, in those situations, the great kids that you're talking right. about, right. the kids that are not really engaged in school that are that need these services to re-engage them in a sort of socially, emotionally, and academically. Yeah, and the ESL sequences are some of the worst. That's right. <laughs> I wanted to shift a little bit, um, and I'm afraid I haven't read your earlier work, but I look forward to it. I was wondering how important do you feel it is. And I'm thinking particularly with the uh, children of Latino immigrants, the second generation, um, to be culturally engaged with their parents' culture, parents' values, and so forth. Uh, you know, the work of Fortes and Brumbo and Fernandez and Kelly point to that as a really critical factor for success. Um, I was wondering what you. My work earlier work talks about it's crucial. I mean, the kids, the kids that feel comfortable with their ethnic identity to tend to do better. But do, are these CBOs addressing that? Most of them do. Most of them yeah. do. I think they do a really good job of being culturally responsive because typically the adults who are running them are part of that community, right? And they're the nice thing is they're embedded in the community, right? And the access to them is, 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 is important. Again, Norton said there's not very many, right? And some come, some go, but. Culturally, cultural responsive is, is key for them. I'm thinking of the work of Victor Rios, who also does stuff with the gangs uh, in sociology. And he argues that um, in his work here in Oakland, looking at um, yeah, youth gangs, that he, he actually doesn't really separate so much uh, the community organizations, but actually aligns them with these processes of surveillance so it's not so much the celebratory component of how it saves, although I'm sure some do, but he problematizes it a little more because uh, he argues that um, they fit the nation state somehow. And so my question is, um, how can the CBOs or this work kind of uh, change the standard of what can we consider success? Because if it's about to go to college and it's about to get a career and it's about to kind of live this adult normative, whatever you want to call it, lifestyle, then I wonder what happens to those in the fringes. And I think which is what your work is trying to do is to get at that population, right? So, um, so it's, wonder, always, it's always the hardest part. Right. So I'm wondering then if, if you look at those nuances, maybe perhaps people who go through the program and then don't succeed. What oh, happens no, there? Oh, absolutely. Or also, um, like in this relationship that you mentioned, which I don't know the details of, but just in my experience with nonprofits that work with urban youth of color, you might have this director who is white or from this background that's completely disconnected. And on the surface level, it might seem like it's great, but in reality, it's pretty perverted or pretty twisted in the sense of the power relations and the racial relations and stuff like that. So I'm just wondering about those oh, nuances no, to. It's, it's completely complicated and nuanced. And I think that. You, you have these organizations, right, again, where you have certain leaders, and they're at odds, because it, they're so stuck on raising money. And they're, they're, they're at this level, and it's actually the workers. There's this one great program called Mother's Club in Pasadena. And all the, all the workers, and what they do is they teach literacy to immigrant mothers, who in turn work with their kids, right? And they actually have like a daycare center on campus, and they actually built this three million dollar complex. So when I interview, and she's 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 white, uh, uh, but all her time is spent on trying to raise money to to you know make sure that this thing is happening. Um, 
I'm sure we're going to find instances. We got to, you know, we have to get more research money so I can have more people there on a daily basis figuring out what's going on. Right? Because there's only so much that interviews can capture, there's only so much that surveys can capture. But I'm sure there's some kind of community based organizations. And I, I probably ran into a couple that are, are not doing a good job. Right? And we have to, we have to be ready to, to deal with these kind of issues. Okay? So it's, you're, you're right. And again, you know, I'm starting this research now. I'm engaging in the literature. So for me, it's you know a completely different domain, uh, uh, which I find exciting. But you know, there's so much, so much more I need to do to get smarter on it. Well, I think those nuances would be really fruitful, yeah. at least for me and my interest, and also just because the uh, question could be, how is it that they promote success and failure? And and how what does success mean, and right. how can we redefine it through these right. maybe successful programs? Because I think if we just leave it uncontested. Then we just kind of replicate with this. So I just think those nuances good. might help us to also. I get a copy of this, right? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be posted. You good. saw the consent form, right? Okay, good. No, good Everybody question. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> how, how do these community based organizations promote some kind of agency? Whether it's, you know, what he said in the back, more of surveillance or failure, but what are the mechanisms that actually can structure for success? And again, complicating the notion of success. I'm sorry. Hey, we, we looked at Casa and Joaquin Murrieta back in the Berkeley years. Juan, right, Juan? Um, I actually have a question. Um, I was interested in an uh, analogy about the football game. I, 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 said, I don't know anything about football. <laughs> 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 Let's learn together. You know, I was thinking about you know football. You know, foot, football clubs focus on football, right? They're not there to educate people to incentivize. People to go well, into education. Yeah. Some of them might try to do that, but they're not programs that are created for that. And what I think uh, your presentation is totally, totally uh, focused on how these community based organizations are changing the perceptions of those participants towards school, right? So, how do they value school once they have the, this intervention to, uh, to the CBOs? And I think that uh, the four pillars that you're talking about is not, which I would say is social capital, mm -hmm. economic capital, mm -hmm. uh, the space in itself, Can we and, say human capital and the youth advocacy. <laughs> okay. um, but I, I, I like you to, um, you're actually talking about one, and I think you, I'm not sure if I missed that in, in the time that I was here, because I came late. But I'm talking about, uh, if you can talk about like, how did these um, CBOs actually uh, develop the human capital on individuals, because it's not, it's not enough to provide them with, uh, with space or, uh, or networks and things like that if they're not trained, right? right. So is there like a, like a after school studying oh, clubs, God, they, libraries, they, they, and things like that? They, and they, that might be one another they, another of your pillars you yes. know, that you're missing, your, your human but capital. I, I put it under the incentive part, but, but you're, you're right. It's like whole human capital and lots of intensive tutoring. You know, from adults, from mentors, from other peers, uh, uh, the technology component that I need to concentrate on. Again, I only concentrate on a little piece of the pie here, right? But the technology component is mm -hmm. crucial. And their ability to raise money to even have computers, in, right? And to have them trained through the computing system. But all these issues of how, how you build that capital is central. I, I just want to bring also um, two things to it that would be interesting to look at. Um, I know that for a quick second, and I'm really embarrassed to say this, um, I actually feared a little bit more, and I was more attuned to the voice of my avid teachers and of my own mom. Mm -hmm. um, so that complication of where does like the authority shift of the individual, because being in that space, you see that space as your healthy space, and everything else as the unhealthy space, like you put it. So in the in the authority of the healthy space, like you, like, like the vocabulary, I'm trying to use the, the vocabulary that you're presenting to us, um, that becomes my exemplar, and I and I try to imitate whatever's in that energy and what those bodies are doing. So what someone is bringing up is when it when you're coming into Calexico, to to Boston, to East LA, whatever, and those generative bodies are these other bodies outside of my own identities and what's around me, I become to gravitate towards that. And then the cultural component comes into play where all of a sudden, my mom becomes a problem because you're not that person. 
And what you're teaching me is not as valuable as them because they're trying to get me to college and have the money, the vans, the technology, the conversations that I can't have with you. But it's not that I can't have it with you, it's that I'm having it with somebody else in a different way. And now you're splitting the person into having different, like, and just because I just read Altuzer, like, different interpolated <laughs> processes. <laughs> like, you're, you're being interpolated very think, different think, in different ways. I think what this particular organization did, they represented it wrong, is not to do that. Mm. You know, not to separate them, but understand that they have to work with the parents. Because what I didn't talk about here is how the caseworkers mm. gain the trust from the parents. Right. Parents are just not going to leave the kids on the streets. You know, they want to have some kind of a, a, a exposure to what they're doing. The caseworkers work really hard mm. to work with the parents. And typically, they're single mothers, mm. right. right? Work with them, gain their trust. Once they gain their trust, the parents said, okay, I trust you, Mike, with my child. Right? Then Mike becomes an advocate for her because she can't advocate in schools because typically they don't listen to these parents. Right? So there was a great trusting relationship and it, it starts with trust. Right? You saw the quote from Michael. Right? Not Michael, the, the student said, Michael is like a father. Right? You know, Michael is talking to me about what I ought to be doing and not doing with girls. Right? right? So so it's you know culturally attuned and uh, the reason I brought up the book by Mark Warren is because, and it complicates things further, can only our own people do that? Or can white people do it, right? right? And so Mike Warren wrote a book on 50 white uh, individuals who all embrace social justice and what that meant. So again, it's like... No, but I, I think what I was trying to say with that is that for an adult, it's really easy to see that. But not for, for a child, it's very different. Because when, when I think about it, I thought I was doing the right thing by listening more to, to my avid teachers. But, and adults, they're making those social like um, contracts. They're making those, I trust you, you trust him. But the child is not even in conversation the with the child interpret that yeah, the, whole life is bad. The, 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 child, the child is the, the, the chess piece. And the child never seems to become like the player with those different agencies. That's it. Good question. Christine. Um, you mentioned that Next time I'm going to keep going for an hour. These questions. <laughs> <laughs> you set yourself up, man. You should know better right now. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that in your book you guys talk about uh, policy and practice. But we haven't written the book yet. Okay, well. <laughs> that, they're going to talk about these going to, So this, that's why I thought it would be great to talk about this because it's all new. Um, well, I guess I was wondering, um, is is one thing that both of you are doing this work, something that you're, or in these implications, do you think it's leaning more towards that schools should be building these partnerships with CEOs, or that schools should be building these kinds of spaces within schools, or both? Both would be great. I mean, some of the, the work I've done here in Oakland, the schools have, for instance, uh, uh, health, what do they call them, health, uh, health academies, or there, oh, right? A tree school base, school, school base. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those were wonderful. They had everything there. And I think uh, Oakland Tech still has that. So the health academy, the, the bio, bio, what's it called? Biotechnology, health and biotechnology academy started a health clinic there, right? And then on top of that, they have internships in the community. So a lot of the mentors that come in are actual doctors from from the Bay Area. So I think it's both in schools and outside of schools. And that's what I've been going towards. Is like all my work has been within schools, but I, I, in, in my first two books, I ignored the social context in which these schools are embedded in, right? If that social the word trust, uh, I think, and the word emotion came up earlier. I think emotion is the, the problem. This is the problem. The whole uh, idea of and critique of schools in general is that they're isolated from the community. I live in West Oakland, you go to the schools there, they either look like a prison or a factory. People, it's not something that's really a vibrant part of the community. So community, you know, um, is based on human relationships. <coughs> human relationship means cultivation, modulating our emotions in a progressive way. And the, the great banning of our educational system is that we don't include emotion. There's that great researcher, I think, University of Michigan, who passed away some years ago, that school success is more a factor of the family of origin than the educational resources. So 
that connection with the community, that's emotional. It's emotional. In you know, relationship. Those yeah. sense of respect, though, you know, simpatico and trust and all that. Gracias. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. This is emotional, you know, and, and without that connection, you know, psychopathology becomes criminal. And that alienation from the community, from each other, human relationships is what inspires and us respect, to be successful. Respect. Respect. <coughs> and that's what a lot of these programs do. So yeah, that human relationship is what inspires us to be successful. And a lot of teachers have it, but they're just so overwhelmed. Right? Hi, so I have two questions. I'll take chairs. <laughs> Privilege to ask them. Um, the first is just, I'm curious to know what they did to scaffold for the kids, because usually when kids are truant, they, they either already were behind, or once they start being truant, they get really far behind in school, and going back to school requires, I just think about my nephew, right, that's yeah. dropped out of ninth grade, and that's part of the reason he could never go back, because he was just, couldn't even follow what's going on. So, so how did they manage to bridge that gap? And then my well, second can question. Have a person in here. Go ahead. Because I'll forget. <laughs> so, so that's where the advocacy comes in. So the, the caseworker will actually go and talk to the teacher and say, what does this person need? Montecano, how are you doing? Martin? No, I'm not here. Montecano. Yeah, Montecano, you're right. Yeah. Uh, can I say we can have a martini after? <laughs> <laughs> so what... That advocacy, 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 advocacy where anyone wants to Your reputation proceeding, man. So that's why, the, that's why the, the advocacy part was really important, because it really worked with the teacher to figure out what does this student need individually. They got in tutors, they got in the extra help, uh, adults, uh, 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 made sure that they were structured in the right learning environment at school. You know, the smaller class size versus the larger is one example. So that, that was key. And so my second question brings us back to sort of policy. I mean, it seems to me there's so much research that really talks about um, the fact that for youth of color having meaningful relationships with adults, whether they're related to them or not, is really what's critical for them to be successful in school and in life, right, in general. And thinking about CDOs, so I'm curious first, how was this organization funded, like just in there, but then thinking about, so what do we say from a policy standpoint, how do we build that infrastructure in communities where those relationships don't exist or they're right. problematic? Like well, how, how do we think that's, about that's where whole, the money's right, gonna come that's to that's make that whole, That's the whole question, what's replicable? Okay. Right, how do you scale it up, right? And you might have certain structural processes that you can take from the program, but is it working in context? What works in Roxbury, Massachusetts, Dorchester might not work in Calaiki, <coughs> might not work in Chula Vista. Yeah. We saw that through Abbott, right? right? Abbott worked wonderfully in, in San Diego, the San Diego area, right? But then they tried to replicate it, and it just didn't work the same, right? But I still argue that there's still some policy implications in that there's still some structural processes that you can replicate. What's difficult to replicate is that culture, right? Uh, uh, you have these wonderful teachers sometimes. And one of them is my dear friend here who I did a book, you know, Color of Success, Patricia Clark. How can we replicate Patricia Clark who stay in high school <laughs> till midnight? And their husband finally says, it's me or the school. And what did she say? It's the school. <laughs> and where do we get the money? I mean, and that's where do we lame. get the money? Right. I don't have any. Well, this is, this is sort of a big policy agenda, and it is framing the needs of kids in school and then in the transition to college, because we've talked about that a bunch, in ways that clarify the non-academic components that schools don't, in some sense, can't get at, and that CDOs can get at better than schools can if they can understand all these non-academic dimensions. And it's like that whole uh, Harlem Children's Zone. Right, they work oh, together, right? Because they can't be separate spheres, right? They have to actually be in concert. And yeah, concert, right. That's right. And but then how you can actually get funding so that all schools and colleges have such a companion CDO. Because, I mean, the story, I mean, you know, the, why did the group in Calexico fall apart after three years, right? Was some kind of funding story. And the funding story for all of these has been, been sort of episodic. Yeah. So, um, yeah, by the way, Gil, can I ask you, have you read Jeff Canada's Fist Thick Knife Gun? No, I need to read it. Well, it, you know, my understanding is that it details for the black community what you're de detailing 
for the Latino community in this phrase, um, street socialization. Mm -hmm. What it's really about is a story where older black males socialize younger black males into and that's the, the same, culture of that's violence. The same, that's the same kind of. And, and which is, of course, an internally very destructive kind of thing. And my understanding, although he's never talked about it, is that Jeff Canada set up the Harlem Children's Zone so you could completely displace Sir the Convenda, socialization right? by older black males by this much. Uh, What's it called? Uh, fist stick knife gun. Okay. Uh, and um, it's really, I mean, you know. Um, is, is, it, is, it, is it like the culture of poverty? Fist stick knife it's, I don't know whether you call it the, well, I mean, it, yeah. But here, yeah, here's, here's, yeah. The, here's, there's a culture here's, of violent uh, black males. Here's the, the they, twist. They like, like, what, what, we're, what we're finding is that these older males come back, right, uh -huh. and help break that socialization. So they've been through this process, they've been through the criminal justice system, they're in prison for 10, 15 years, and something happens in that, and they come back, and we actually, they're used as role models yeah. to help break that cycle, right? And the old veterano coming back and saying, look, this is what happened to me, and you don't want to replicate this. Y yes, yeah. uh, that's right. That's not part of this Dick Knight thing. Okay. Uh, and what, again, you could ask the question, how, you know, sort of like, what's the volume of the different messages, uh, and how many older black men. That's sort of the thing is like we have to be careful that we're not reifying these cultural explanations, right? You know, in the same way that you articulated in the person in the back, is that we're not rearticulating this, you know, this whole culture pathology. But rather how is it that poverty, the cultural ecology of poverty, is creating these circumstances? Right? Are we done? Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say please join me in thanking Gil for